Hello and welcome back to the OMG Moto GP podcast where we chat all things about the fastest two-wheeled motorbikes in the planet. The 2024 Moto GP season has officially started. I'm your host Renita and as always joined by Keith. And before we get into our Qatar debrief, Keith, you recently sat down with a very special guest. So guys, I want to take you to our interview with Michael Laverty. Michael, good to see you. Nice to see you at home for a change. That's a fairly <laughs> rare item, isn't it, being at home? It's been nice, actually. I've spent a lot more time at home through the preseason than I have done recently. So working from home is good. Obviously, post-COVID, we've got used to it. But uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I've been traveling a lot the last couple of years since I set up the team and everything with uh, what's going on behind the scenes. But yeah, nice to be home. Let's take let's take a look at uh, Qatar, shall we? The first round this year. I mean, obviously, uh, there's all the speculation and all the and the like, predictions about what's going to go on. Um, Qatar has changed hugely. The The whole place is now a completely different kettle of fish. It's, it's almost within the city boundary now, whereas it used to be right out in the desert. What was it like when you rolled up there this year? Yeah, honestly, it's such a a, a nice environment they built in the paddock. Obviously, it was when it, it was originally built. The circuit was so remote, distant from Doha. Now Doha, the city itself, has grown to the boundaries of the circuit, and it seems to be growing even further. But the recent renovation of the paddock puts it, um, I guess, the best in the, in the MotoGP uh, arena. It is going Formula 1-esque in terms of the the image, how the pit boxes are built, even the, the offices behind the scenes for the teams and riders. It it, um, it has a, a nice feel to it. And welcoming, it's a yeah, very welcoming paddock. Still not got the footfall that you would hope for. It doesn't doesn't drag that many fans there. There was a few from the UK visiting and they commented as well that it's so quiet here and you do get access to the to the riders and a little bit more behind the scenes than you would do if you visit a European race and you get a paddock pass, you might not see too much where the riders go motorhome to the garage and then back again. Whereas here, it, it is quite a, a relaxed environment. It's a nice place to be to have the season opener. Every cloud has a silver lining, of course, for the likes of you that um, times his life by the second Getting out of there on a Sunday night is quite uh, quite quite easy <laughs> to get to the airport and you can get home by Monday morning. Yeah, one of the few races actually, even though we finish later than we would normally in Europe, but you can get easy access, get a, well, we were on a 150 flight overnight back into Heathrow at 6.35 yesterday morning. So yeah, perfect to be back on a, on a Monday morning when possible. Let's talk about um, Moto3, Moto2. But first of all, if I can, let's talk about MotoGP. Motor Grand Prix, it just doesn't seem to be quite the start to the year that some of us were expecting. For and sure. I'm wondering from your technical expertise, and you are quite analytical on these kind of things, whether aero and launch control and all these things has actually pulled MotoGP back into the sort of Formula One arena, if you like, where there isn't that much passing. And even with the expectation of a great race, and we really had it all, I really was expecting something fantastic this this week it isn't as good as moto 3 or even moto 2 at the moment because we just don't see the passing is that because riders and these bikes as they are at the moment can't make those passes unfortunately that seems to be the case so we we hyped up the the potential battle because we've so many contenders lapping at a similar pace so all of a sudden on paper you've got 10 potential race winners and you think this is going to be a fantastic race but unfortunately, it ends up almost like a time trial. So the rider who leads halfway around lap one, they have control of the, the destiny of the race. So the rider ducking in behind will overheat their front tyre if they're too close and they need to immediately make an overtake. And it's so difficult because the braking zones are are less. They're they're coming in faster. They're stopping quicker because the, the, the bike's lower. It's more stable with all the, all the aero. So the window to make an overtake on the brakes has sort of gone. So you almost need a mistake for a rider to go in a little hot, as we've seen riders running off track at the fast right-handers and nipping up the inside. So it wasn't the classic... I don't think it'll be the case at every race, but it wasn't the classic MotoGP that we wanted where there were lots of overtaken opportunities. Qatar, as well, is unique in that the riders have a pre-season test there, so they've really got the bikes dialed. So the the scenario when you're in Europe and you only have a Friday morning session that is free, then Saturday afternoon, although it's it's got a window there where you can work on setup but it generally the last 15 20 minutes are qualifying through to q2 so it's a pre-qualifying session sometimes weather interrupts so you arrive with a few more question marks on saturday afternoon for the sprint 
Whereas now these guys had everything dialed. And it is, Arrow's a problem. I think lowering devices as much as Arrow, because you're never putting the Arrow back in the in the bottle, the genie is out. Whereas lower devices could be banned, and I think that would help the tire pressure scenario. Arrow's obviously going to put a big load in it, but Mitchell and R bringing a new front tire that hopefully will cope with those Arrow loads in the future. But yes, yeah, something will change. I'm almost sure of it when the rules change in 2027, but we've got a long time until the, the next generation of MotoGP rules evolve. So we, we hope the Michelin front will fix it for 2025 and that it's not the first answer on the riders' um, minds after they finish the race that front tire temperature went too high, couldn't overtake, couldn't stay in the slipstream. I, I loved seeing a rookie like Pedro Acosta just making those overtakes, just staying in the draft, and that was the racing that you want to see, but be, he learned from his mistakes and he won't do that in future. He'll sit out of the draft, he'll make his passes whenever he can on those key moments, so... Yeah, it becomes a little bit more strategy involved, which is a very Formula One thing and not something we want our sport to go down that route. Well, you mentioned Pedro Acosta and it was a bit of a disaster for him. He was the exciting uh, mover and shaker early on and you're right, he just burnt his tyres out and he ended up where he ended up. Um, of course, the other big name that comes to um, round one was Mark Marquez on the Grassini Ducati for the first time as well, in a race for the first time. Um, he... Uh, might have benefited it looked to me from from where i was watching from rail fernandez having the problem that he had on the new track house bike when they delayed the start because it looked like you mentioned the ride height adjustment it looked as if marquez had got a problem with his ride height adjuster at the start the original start as it was to be yeah i seen frankie carcetti denied that one yesterday on twitter when asked the question but yeah the problem is they're quite complicated when they roll up on the grid to get the front of the bike down, the rear of the bike down, engage your, your launch start device in terms of the limiter and torque control that the, the engineers have programmed in there. And if it doesn't uh, work, then they're pretty difficult to start and can be dangerous, as we've seen in uh, some instances where the lower device is stuck down. So yeah, Mark may have had a had a, a little bit of luck on his side there if, if that was the case that he was having issues. But yeah, it's something that I think has uh, safety grounds in terms of when they reevaluate the rules to throw out the lower device because of these issues that happen on the grid. Any surprises to you? I mean, anything that was unexpected over the over the weekend, apart from the weather, of course, on on the Friday, which might may again you talked about they may well have tested there, but of course the track changed hugely from uh, day one when we had a lot of rain. Um, it does put the old MotoGP boys off a bit, doesn't it? Because they're their test session really is down to the second. Everything is pre-planned to, to get to the, the race on uh, Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, exactly. And on a weekend such as uh, you normally get in the desert, you don't ever anticipate. So even how you manage your tyre allocation, you're always thinking you're going to use those extra tyres on a Friday afternoon. So yeah, they had to uh, they had to go back to the drawing board a little bit. I do think that the, there wasn't too many surprises. I think we all expected Ducati to be strong. We expected Aprilia to be there and, and KTM as well. The Japanese manufacturers have moved closer. There's no doubt about that. But unfortunately, the, the bar has been raised again by the Italians and the Austrians. So the game's ever evolving. I think Brad Binder was really impressive. I'm slightly, I know it's only round one, but slightly worried for Jack Miller. He's fast and he's there. He does a great job for KTM. But the problem is when you have Pedro Acosta coming into their umbrella, although it's a KTM branded gas gas, it is... Um, it's worrying for Jack's future because there's a lot of Moto2 riders looking at those seats and yeah, you, you, you know a few riders will be feeling the pinch. So um, I think there's such a high level in MotoGP right now. Uh, it's it's going to be a, a difficult season all round. I think we're going to have Aprilia's at the match some weekends. Maybe it doesn't look like they've fixed everything in terms of the consistency over 21 rounds. I think Ducati have that dialed and KTM are inching closer and now they've got uh, two contenders in Pedro Acosta and Brad Binder, and I think Jack will have some some strong weekends in there too. So it's um, it's the cards are falling how we sort of predicted. I think Ducati have now got even better at evolving their bikes year on year. Where Gigi was confidently saying ahead of the weekend that we know these parts are going to work. It's no longer a, a guessing game. The the mathematics and the engineering that goes into it. It's it, there's no longer a roll of the dice. They they calculate exactly what they need to improve and they know how to do it. In your opinion, and from what you're seeing at Trackside, um, the concessions, the new concession rules, which are brilliant. I mean, I think they, said that they had to do it and they've done a good job as far as I'm concerned, rules-wise. Can you see Honda and Yamaha, particularly Honda, but Yamaha maybe, can you see them making any step during the course of this year? I do. I'm 
a fan of the concession rules and I do see already there's progress from Honda. I think uh, it's going to take a little bit of time listening to Joan Zarco speak. The engine's strong, the front end's better, grip's not there. They have enough tyres in their allocation now to test with with Zarco, with Marini, with Mir, with uh, Nakagami. So they'll they'll have their riders on track alongside Stefan Bradl and the Japanese. They will uh, come up with a new aero body, which they'll be able to introduce. They'll be able to adjust the engine specification throughout the year. So they're no longer tied as they previously would have been. So their evolution will continue throughout the season. They'll get closer. I don't see them overtaking any of the European manufacturers this year, but if they put their riders into the mix to challenge them, in year one of the new concessions, that will be a result. Uh, Yamaha, again, very similar story in terms of the, the progression is there. You can see it, but there's still that little bit of drift. And it is a second race where they, they're not massively um, that far behind on a per lap, but it ends up 11, 12 seconds back at the end of the sprint. And you're thinking you're just not quite there to challenge the European manufacturers. And it is ex-world champions, Juan Mir and Fabio Quadraro battling with their uh, their Japanese um, stablemates. So... Yeah, the, the Japanese manufacturers are, are making inroads. They're changing how they work. They're changing crew. They're pinching engineers from other manufacturers, which is something they didn't previously do. So I think their their way of working that worked for two decades or more in terms of how they developed and how they brought parts to the track, they've had to change that. The, the dynamics that the Italian and Austrians have brought where they, they engineer something, they bring it to the test bed, and then they put it on track and bring it to a race within... Uh, three four week period that's um that's something the japanese don't do but they're starting to now it's not an easy arena anymore is it there if it ever was um the fact of the matter is everything is so close the problem is i suppose as well is is all these manufacturers make power or make grip or make differences in different places on the racetrack and it's where the majority have the most advantage which is ducati at the moment in most places um we've seen yamaha that's a bit faster now than it's ever been but it's still not playing to its own tune when you're in a group of motorcycles i don't i think it's difficult for people to understand that it's, it's all very well doing one lap isn't it you get you get a fast time one lap when you're you're left alone to pick your own line your own braking points your own acceleration points and so on um, but as soon as you've got a whole load of fast motorbikes around you that are miring effectively your corner speed mid corner speed whatever it might be that's where the the japanese manufacturers seem to be at sea it is a case of well especially yamaha because they are the only inline four manufacturer having the four cylinders across the frame. It gives them a strength, especially as you mentioned, the the chassis readability and the feeling they have to carry a high corner speed flowing lines, which worked so well for, well, Valentino Rossi, Jorge Lorenzo, Maverick Vinales for a number of uh, seasons. It, it can deliver results, but when you're mired into a group of 300 horsepower Ducatis, you've got eight of those around you. You've got Aprilia's up there with horsepower KTMs as well. You can't run your own lines. You can't ride your own race. You can't take advantages from the package you have. So it, it is changing. I don't think the inline four is dead yet. I do think there's still ability from uh, how the how the engine creates grip, how the chassis creates grip. And I think grip is the, the key right now. Using the spec tire, you know, everyone's on the, the, the same rubber. So learning how to, to extract the maximum to get the propulsion off the corner, whether that's with the lower device, with a smoother torque model or a smoother engine character combined with your aero, not letting the bike pivot and wheelie and getting the maximum acceleration off the corner. That's where Ducati do it so well. And that's what KTM still can't match Ducati in that arena. They they have a, a such a high horsepower engine, but they put it to the to the ground like it's a little Moto 3 bike initially. The first touch of the throttle is so soft, the riders feel the grip, the traction, and they just launch off the turn and the front wheel hovers off the ground a couple of mil just fork extension is perfect they've got it all dialed it and it just works and it makes it look physically easier for the rider but you can see how they leap off the turn it's uh, impressive to watch but it's a long season and different motorcycles will suit different tracks to a degree wherever we go um how do you see the next round I think Portimao is a different animal because mm. in Qatar it always seems difficult for the rider to <laughs> make a big difference. You, you're sort of hamstrung a little bit in that you're managing your 22 litres of fuel, so you have to be on the maps that the engineers recommend because you'll <laughs> run out of fuel if you go aggressive. Likewise with tyre uh, wear. So I think when you go to Portimao, the oh. elevation, it's actually a, a narrower racetrack and a rider can <laughs> dig deep. They can take the bike outside its comfort zone. You know, when you watch a Ducati rider and watching Mark was the one that 
really stood out. He looked like he's writing in a Skeletrix type way, which Mark never does, you know, keeping everything in line, fast and flowing, but but in a controlled manner. And Mark yeah. never rides controlled. So I think when you go to the Lex in Porto Mau, he can take the bike outside of where it's supposed to work and he can start overriding it. At the minute, he's not. Maybe overriding it won't yeah. work with Ducati, but I think you'll see a little bit more of the, the rider input around such a, a rolling racetrack mm. as Porto Mau. Slightly worrying. Mark out of control on a Ducati at Porto Mau. I think we've seen <laughs> some of that before. Past history. <laughs> Michael, it's been a real pleasure talking to you about Qatar. Obviously, um, hopefully we can catch up with you more and more and more as the year goes on. I mean, I really appreciate you giving us the time on OMG MotoGP. Um, thanks for joining us and uh, we wish you all the luck. And of course, you can catch up with Michael later on on OMG MotoGP because we will be talking to him about his own team, about Moto3 and Moto2 um, as the year progresses. So um, keep an eye out for that. Subscribe to us if you would, and that will ping up as soon as that drops on OMG MotoGP. Oh, that was awesome. Keith, I really loved the insight that Michael gave to us from being actually at Qatar. What was your thoughts from the Grand Prix? I think that I'm going to pick up on the the aero and um, launch control type scenario that we have in MotoGP at the moment. I mean, everybody is beginning to get fed up with it, to be frank with you, riders, teams, and particularly the fans. I think when we've got a situation where, you know, the racing isn't quite as good, when you've got Moto3, which is always consistently good, you know, you can argue that MotoGP bikes are all within a second now of each other, effectively, over, over a, a complete lap. Um, Moto3 is always like that. Um, so it's not about the performance of the bikes or how close they are. It's about whether you can make the passes, whether you can make the opportunity work for you. And in Moto3, you still can because aero isn't such a major thing. Launch control is not such a major thing. Rah, rah, rah. Um, so it's a situation where we, we've gone slightly wrong with, with the rules package. You know, World Superbikes is coming of age again, isn't it? World Superbikes is looking really, really good. Phillip Island, you were down at Phillip Island for, for World Supers and it was a great race meeting. Some of the you know, Alex Lowe's passing, you know, Bautista over Lukey Heights. I mean, <laughs> you know, anybody, it, it was a little bit special. And we want that back in MotoGP. Uh, we've got it in Moto3. We've got it to an extent in Moto2. And uh, we want it back in MotoGP. And I think it is a bone of contention. We've got a rules package that's coming up in 2027. Um, as you heard Michael say, we've got a, a, a tire scenario that's going to change for next year, which may give us a a slightly more competitive um, situation, but uh, we need passing. We need rubbing is racing, you know, to use a NASCAR terminology. Now that we've got Justin Marks in track house, we'll use rubbing is racing, boy. So we've got to be out, <laughs> we've got to go rubbing again, I'm afraid. it's It's got to be that way. It's so um, important because obviously with the whole tyre pressure rules that are coming in and now, you know, these Ducati or the European manufacturers are having on their dashboards saying, what percentage of the race that they are in and how is the tire going? Do they need to slipstream? Do they not? And it's just all these extra things that are incorporating for the rider where you're right, then there's not the real racing happening anymore. I mean, we saw a little bit with Pedro being his first race, the rookie, and we'll, we'll chat a bit more about him. But majority of it, it's all it's all strategic, right? Well, yeah, the only reason we saw Pedro um, racing at the level he was racing at and, and maneuvering in and out of all the big names was because he hadn't yet got tire management in his head and and that's why he fell away at the end of the race because his tire management was completely wrong qatar is a is a is a track that you need tire management management and also fuel management it's a it's a track that, that uses a lot of fuel so at the end of the day um qatar is not representative i don't think of the rest of the year um i mean it's grand prix of the year from a from a rider and a team perspective now with the facilities that have changed the way they have and so on. And it's a great race to start the beginning of the year with biggest crowd that they have 40,000 people over the entire three days. Um, that's four times as much as there used to be. You'd end up with, you know, five or 6,000 people at trackside uh, maximum back in the day. So Qatar is an emerging market. Um, the amount of money in Qatar is important to the sport. Um, I'm going to dodge the politics side of things and, and, and on all the other bits and pieces like human rights. I know it's something that we shouldn't dodge and it's it's not that I'm ignoring it, but the point is I want to look at it from a, a moving forward point of view. Qatari money, um, that's the reason why we are where we are. We have that at the beginning of the season. We kick off the year because the Qataris are paying for that privilege of starting our season, even though they make no money out of the Grand Prix at all. 
um, from a spectator, from a sponsor point of view. Um, you know, is that right or wrong? Well, as the sport is at the moment, we're just going to have to take it as it is. Um, it, it brings up more questions than uh, than we really feel comfortable about. And there are many, there are journalists who won't travel to Qatar because of the way um, it's perceived. Um, I think riders tend to concentrate just on what they're doing. So they're blinkered in what they're doing. And you can understand that as well. But the sports management, Dorna, you know, and the like really will be acutely aware of the downside of being in bed quite so deep with the likes of Qatar as an opening round. Um, but as I say, that's a story that I said I wasn't going to talk about. And then I did, <laughs> which is so I... me, Nita. <laughs> I actually thought it was really interesting from a fan's perspective to hearing Michael talk about the fact that Qatar is almost a bit more fan friendly. You can get up close and personal. And I guess I get to experience that here with the Australian Grand Prix. It's not a big paddock. It's very small. You see the riders walking around. Do you hear that at another race when you experience these big European paddocks with the trucks and hospitality and all that fancy setup? It sounds like it's a bit more relaxed, let's say. Well, yeah, I think it is relaxed because of the, the. You've probably got more people in the paddock at Misano or Mugello or somewhere like that, an Italian round, than you've got standing on the terraces at uh, Qatar. Because somehow, despite the fact that Michael was talking about the restriction of tickets and the like as well, you know, somehow there doesn't seem to be that kind of restriction when we get to Misano because every Italian that's worth his salt has got a free ticket from somewhere. I've never quite worked that one out, but someone will be able to somewhere. Um, I don't know. As as we move on, I, I think that that it's Qatar is not a great example. When we get to Portimao next time, that's going to be a bit more cut and thrust. I mean, I'm looking forward to the likes of Mark Marquez unleashed um, in in the likes of Portimao. I love Portimao. Um, there's a racetrack that was bordering on bankruptcy just a few years ago until the pandemic came and Formula One was looking for tracks, and suddenly Formula One was at Portimao. MotoGP was at Portimao. And, and luckily, it's kind of saved a group of people and, and a country, if you like, a, a fantastic Grand Prix. Um, and long may it last in Portimao. Um, what else was, came out of, 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 of Qatar? For me, Raul Fernandez, who was my bold prediction here on ONG MotoGP, Raul Fernandez was there or thereabouts. Um, he had a technical problem on the grid. Um, Stuck his hand in the air and held and delayed the start um, and had to start on his number two bike, as it turns out. So it was a significant um, technical problem. Um, in the end, Trackhouse, the, the new Aprilia team run by Justin Marks from NASCAR, um, ended up with just one point when I thought Miguel Oliveira and particularly Raul Fernandez um, looked like they could achieve much more than that in their first Grand Prix. But nevertheless, they'll, they'll be thankful for the one point their opening point in the championship in uh, their first ever grand prix and i like track house and the full-on american livery i've got to say i actually wanted to ask your opinion on aprilia aprilia came into this weekend as being the favorites i think even mark said that he expected alesh to be up the front and we saw that in the sprint with Aleish, obviously he had those rear tire troubles in the main Grand Prix, but what happened to Aprilia expected to be at the front? Is it just because of these rumors that the bike's going to suit Aleish or? I think Aleish and Maverick Vinales were fast at times. I mean, Maverick Vinales was a, was a hot shot from warm up in the morning and looked like he might well be um, up for the business. But, but there's a Kevin Schwantz um, saying that I love the American, the, the delightful American Kevin Schwantz who, um, uh, re reported on one particular rider, I won't mention the name, but he said he's going to come apart like a cheap watch. And um, and that's what happened. You know, yeah. you can never really bet on Maverick Vinales coming up with the goods at the moment. He's he's such a brilliant rider, such a fast rider, in my view, faster than Aleish. Um, Aleish is a screen buyer. He gets hold of it and he gives it so and he gets himself in position. Aleish Espargaro is a, is a is a good rider, but Maverick Vinales for me is just a cut above in the finesse department, but still underperforms. And it's a big disappointment. I really thought that one or both of them were going to be contenders this weekend. I never bet on them because I've bet on them before and I've lost my money. So um, we'll wait and see. 
but disappointing. Of, well, yeah, definitely. One of the other things that came out from Qatar that I wanted to talk about was chatter. And it's not something that you necessarily hear that much happening anymore, but it seems like it was all the European bikes were talking about chatter, chatter constantly. Peko said that's why his uh, performance in the sprint wasn't that good. Even watching Marquez come into one of the, I think it might've been a right-hander, you could see the back of the bike. What was happening? Because it doesn't normally happen at Qatar. We didn't hear about it at the test. What was happening this weekend? Ah, well, you see, there's a big difference between testing and where we are for when we come to racing. And it's the time of day. What happens is, is you're, you're testing in the sunshine and when the track's absolutely boiling hot and you've got different grip levels. As you get into the nighttime and the track temperature comes down, you've got more grip in the evening than you do have, you know, in, in when it's transitioning from sunshine into the evening. So the point being is, is throughout the race, you're getting more and more grip, which creates chatter. You've not quite dialed it out of the bike. Um, if they'd had more nighttime testing, then they'll have got rid of it by the time we got to the main event. Um, but unfortunately, chatter is the most annoying bloody phenomenon. It really is. I mean, uh, effectively, it's, it's just the, the, the suspension not being able to cope with uh, what's going on at the, in this particular case at the rear end. Sometimes you get chatter at the front. This seems to be more chatter at the rear. But when you've got chatter, you've got a lack of grip because obviously it's not able to kind of grip as as, as you would expect it to or have expected it to in, in the previous hours of, of running the bike so it was a problem um don't expect it in poorly mail we'll be all right when we get consistent yeah. and the other thing as well is we, we were missing we were missing sessions it was wet on on the friday we had that rain that thunderstorm and the light that came into to doha uh washed all the grip out of the track as well so the track will have been evolving all the way through the weekend and that is a suspension man's nightmare um to try and get that right I heard that the the travel was something like six mil or something, which is crazy, right? Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. But <laughs> what I did want to talk about was the fact that Pecco said that he was struggling with this. You know, that's why I was so surprised to not see him up on the podium for the sprint race. Then morning warm up. Sorry, well, the, sprint, the sprint race. The sprint race is a pardon the phrase is a balls out session, isn't it? It's there's no time mm -hmm. management, no fuel management. It is just throw everything at it which is what we kind of like about the sprint race i'm not sure everybody likes it i think it seems it's always a bit of a nerve-wracking experience the first sprint race of the year um but when we get to the main race and we're into management i mean peko bagnaya mm. was immaculate he rode that race really it was a he was an artist um it's annoying i just want to see a flat out race with everybody you know making it happen um, Pedro Acosta was stunningly exciting as we expected him to be, but he ran out of tires because he was stunningly exciting. You know, it was quite funny seeing him stick one over, um, Mar Marquez, you know, like what I youngsters flashbacks uh, from Qatar 2013, where Mark did the same thing, the inside of Valentino. And it was like, Oh, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. And look how that turned out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the end. <laughs> So we can only hope that we have the same kind of rivalry between uh, Pedro Acosta and uh, hopefully Mark Marquez if Mark Marquez hits the kind of form that we expect him to this year. Oh, yeah, it, it's quite funny. The, the amount of people that bet on Mark Marquez winning in Qatar, I'd have been astounded if that. Um, you know, yeah. I think that his positioning in the end yeah, was, 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 was really good. I think it, he... Crew chief Frankie Carcetti, we hear you hear us talk about Frankie a lot. Um, you know, they put together a good, solid program for the opening race of the year. Brad Binder was there where we wanted him to be, right in the hunt. KTM are there or thereabouts. But he seems to be the man that's risen above everything that's happening to KTM at the moment. Um, and, and Binder, again, if you've not seen the interview that uh, went out on OMG MotoGP, there is one in our timeline, so check it out. Um, Brad Binder, prior to the weekend, spoke with us. Um, I think Binder's going to be a fly in the... Ducati ointment during the course of this year. I've got a feeling that he's definitely got the mentality for it. KTM are really moving. Yeah, as he has said, they've made a big step in all departments, albeit that everyone else has made quite a big step as well. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see whether they can just fine tune that, just get that extra out of the motorbike when we get to the more traditional uh, racetracks that they'll be racing on. Like I say, Qatar is an odd one. It's at night. Conditions were not perfect. There was a lot of dust and dirt around. If you remember back in the test that, you know, the place wasn't usable for the first day. There was so much sand on the track. Um, 
So it, it, I don't think we've seen anywhere near like the full potential of, of most of these motorbikes yet or riders. Yeah, exactly. Look, the race wasn't exciting. It wasn't thrilling apart from Pedro, like we said. But what I did want to talk about was the consistency. Pedro, I'm oh, sorry, um, Peko Banyaya, consistent with those lap times. If you look at his race pace, once he got out the front, constantly 152, 152. And you could just tell that he was like, I'm just going to bank this down and I'm going to go for it. And the same with Brad Binder, like you're talking about is he understands that bike now. They've made that step in the direction. He's okay, tire conservation. I know how to handle that. I can keep putting that pressure on Pecco. Pecco didn't get that far ahead of Brad even by the end of the race distance, did he? No, but he was managing the whole thing from the lights out. And that was the fact of that. He, he put a big effort in to get out front early. That takes, you know, you got you got to be on it to, to, to make that move, to get yourself in front and manage the race from the front with a full tank of fuel. Um, they will have done full tank run, probably one, um, but he's got the experience. I just think it was immaculate, and that's how you win title. That is how, you know, if he wins a third title this year, and you've got to say, with that performance of the weekend, you know, fully fit. Jorge Martin is still the man that's going to take it to him. Um, but again, Jorge Martin's style perhaps he uses a little bit more of the motorbike than, or tyre particularly, than, than Peko does. Brad Binder was renowned for being able to sort of, even though I've, I've, I've spoken to him about it, about he's got an aggressive looking style, but it's actually quite smooth on the bike. So he's got a motorbike at the end of a race as well. <clears throat> it's going to be interesting to see whether anybody can match the likes of Peko Benner. Port him out is going to be, it's like a motocross track. You know, Port him out is, is a, um, it's a bike race's, you know, absolute paradise. You've got Philip Iron, Port him out, Mugello. They've got certain corners in them where you have just, you've got so much fun on the thing to make it work. And we'll see what comes out when we, when we get to Port him out. I'm really looking forward to Port him out. I don't think we're going to have quite the um, lack of cut and thrust that we had at the, the weekend. I think that that, is really part of Qatar's makeup that they've got to manage motorcycles. You know, they were miles off the pace, really, um, through probably two thirds of that race, um, which surprised it, even me. We were expecting it, but it was a, quite a long way off of what they, those bikes were potentially capable of doing. Which again is why we had the Acosta factor. He was right there in it and and sticking out the inside and and doing what he does. Um, but then he ran out of motorbike, um, which is what he's <laughs> going to do. But when we get to Porty Mail. That ain't going to be the case, I don't think. Oh, no, I'm so excited to see Pedro Costa at Puerto Mal. One thing that I did find really interesting in the post-race debrief, though, Jorge Martin said he still doesn't feel completely comfortable on the GP24. And you could kind of see that in his riding style, right? He He's there, but he's not there. 24 by, with, this is an old, you know, from an old racer point of view, and you don't get any older than me, um, is that, when you get your first factory bike, you know, you, you think, oh, I've got my factory bike. I've got the full on, you know, it's the dog's what's it's. And suddenly you get on it and you go, oh, crikey, this isn't quite what I was expecting. Because it is a cutting edge, brand new motorcycle that has nuances that need to be dialed in. You need to work out how that motorbike is best going to, it's still going to be, it's going to be the best bike because the factory are behind it. They've made the modifications chances are what you've got is the likes of Marquez and the rest of them that are on motorbikes that are a year old. Um, they've got the data. Yeah, they've got all the information they need when they get to these early rounds. But by the time we get to rounds three, four, five, the 24 bikes are suddenly going to be coming into their own because suddenly they've got the data. The, 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 che the, the data guys have, have downloaded everything they need. They've made the comparisons with everyone else that's running 24 bikes. And so they will be finding their legs later in the in the season and the older bikes will perhaps be falling behind you know everybody says how much better the bike is but they haven't quite got the parameters worked out perfectly just yet it will come though i i just i you know i looked down when we were talking about acosta a minute ago i, I loved the quote that he he gave i think it was to tnt to the old bt model just put your balls on and go now that said so that that's a phrase Worthy of one of the best phrases from MotoGP over the years, I feel. Uh, and I think that kind of indicates where we might be going with uh, young Acosta. <laughs> he's uh, he's not shy to speak his mind, is he? 
which is exciting. He's um, They're calling him like Valentino used to be when he's younger and he's exciting in the press conferences and in the interviews and it's not cookie cutter, boring. He's, he's definitely going to tell it how it is, I think. I, I think also, sorry, I must have sort of disjointed this is, but I ought to mention Trackhouse as well. They got their one point, but one of the reasons why Miguel Oliveira was a bit behind is he had to do a long lap penalty that he'd inherited from before. So Oliveira had a long lap penalty in the middle of there, which which pretty much kills your race if you've not got the toe from the main men at the at the end of the day. So um, that's another reason why there was only a point for track houses this weekend. Yeah, no, definitely not the start that Miguel was wanting to his 2024 season. But hopefully as he does go to Portimao next, week next week next month oh so yep. letting in the next round <laughs> anyway <laughs> um hopefully his Portimao 2024 race is a lot better than his 2023 yeah i mean you you want the thing about the, the start of a season that's as long as this 42 rounds um 21 of them scoring full points half of them scoring half points obviously for the sprint races but you do not need injury you know the the Franco Morbidelli at the moment is suffering again at the beginning of the year with an injury. It's just, you know, a disaster. When you've got rounds that come thick and fast like they do, you know, by the time, in fact, the, the, the Grand Prix at the weekend at Qatar was the first time since the beginning of last year that we had a full grid. You know, there was not a oh, grid yeah. full of the full on, you know, entry list um, for, for, for a year since we last had a full grid because of injury, because of the amount of riders that were taken out during the course of the year. So that will have a major effect on on the championship by the end of the year, which is a, another reason why the Peko Magnaias of the world that, 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 that gave that control. I've been guilty of not considering Peko Bagnaia as an alien. A phrase that we've, it's an old fashioned phrase really now, that, that it's, it's a motorcycle racer that's doing something that even the top line motorcycle racers go, huh? How's he doing that? You know, it's a, it's a kind of, that's an alien. He's somebody that does something on a motorbike that you, you just can't recognize even as a motorcycle, as a fellow motorcycle. Um, and we, I, I've, I've been guilty of saying that, that there aren't really any aliens anymore because everybody's virtually the same, doing the same thing. Maybe that's aero, maybe that's launch control, all these other devices that they've got now that's ground that out of the, out of the system, if you like. Um, but Peko Bangnaya's way of riding a motorbike this weekend if that continues that may be the new generation of alien it's the guy that's able to control himself in the circumstances that these new devices are making you work like how how you have to be on a motorbike now to get the best from it maybe it's not the guy that's you know got the front end tucked and the rear end hanging out and and you know tank slapping his way all the way down the front straight. It, it, it's a different style of motorbike racing. And maybe Peko Bangnaya is an alien. It's just different. I mean, this year's going to tell if he can take that third consecutive title. Are we going to see Professor Peko back on top? Is this the new way to ride at MotoGP? Time's only going to tell, right? Yeah, the contrast is Mark Mar Marquez. It's uh, it's going to be. A, it was interesting to see Mark. You would have said that Mark was a little subdued at the weekend, but I think he's still getting the swing of that Ducati. Um, yeah, testing is testing. We're now in our first race. You know, longer distances, difficult track. You know, dark. You know, in, under floodlights, so on and so forth. I thought Mark was quite subdued. Um, Mark in the past would have been, you know, hanging the thing out. You know, crashing at every single corner. Um, and and finishing on the podium, I think he was well within a podium. I think it, there was a podium within him. Um, should he have wanted to push even harder? Uh, but I think he he definitely looked to me like a man that was using a bit of discretion. Um, <laughs> can't believe I just said that in the same sentence as Mark Marquez. But the, but the point being is that that is going to come well as this season moves on. It's just a question of whether the the twenty twenty four bikes just move away from him a little bit as as the season progresses. I mean, there. I think nuance is the word. We didn't get the races we were expecting. They weren't exciting um, in MotoGP. But I think analysing everybody and looking at everybody, looking at the timesheets, excuse me, breakfast, um, it's one of those situations where uh, I think we've got a lot to look forward to. I don't think it's going to be dull um, all year long. I think that, that you know, we'd be wrong to to hang the series out to dry just because of the the Qatar procession 
Oh, definitely. And I completely agree. Back to the the Mark Marquez point, you know, you mentioned Frankie Carcetti. He said it's going to take Mark multiple races to completely understand this Ducati. Watching him over the weekend in the practice and the qualifying sessions, you can tell he is really trying to change his riding style a lot as well to suit that bike. And there were some parts of the track that he was fastest out of everybody, you know, so it's things are starting to click. But yeah, it is going to take him time. Are we going to see him closer to the front in Portimao? Maybe, but are we going to see some of the others like an Abashanini closer to the front in Portimao? Yeah, Abashanini. Abashanini had a bit of a disappointing. I say disappointing. He had a, a, you know, I was expecting Abashanini to be uh, more there or thereabouts for this one because he's he's always gone good at Qatar Kat, uh, before. I think Mark. I, again, I'm I'm sorry to keep bringing back old things, but I I still question Mark Mark's arm. You know. We'll wait and see. He's developing a style for Ducati and a style for himself based on the way that he feels on the Ducati. Um, And those two things are connected fairly, you know, substantially. So I think Mark is still on that voyage of discovery. He's got the right guy alongside him. Carcetti is going to look after him in the way that he did with uh, Digi and Antonio. Um, You know, Digi suddenly had a completely different setup to everyone else in Ducati because him and Carcetti decided that, okay, let's... Let's chuck the form book and the and the and the setup book out the window and, and go with where we feel we ought to be going. And I, I and Mark will be doing the same thing. You know, we've talked about the the changes in team personnel. You know, you got to remember that that's a major issue for Mark Marquez. He's not got Santi Hernandez alongside him like he had a Repsol Honda for for all those years. Santi Hernandez was like a brother. Those two were joined at the hip. They understood every little you know glance or raise of the eyebrow or whatever it might be. There was this kind of communication between them, and and Frankie and 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 uh, Mark working this out still, yeah. You know, and then there's the wider implication of the, the Grassini team, which is a, which is probably a slightly less harsh environment. Then there's the other dynamic of Alex Marquez, who is a fast runner at Grassini and a world champion previously. Um, and he's finding his own feet, and the number seventy-three might be putting pressure on the number ninety-three in the own, in the same team. So there's a lot of things, a lot of plates spinning in Grassini at the minute. Good team though to to have around you in those circumstances. Um, I think pastoral care. I think they 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 probably got that one fairly well covered. It seemed seemed funny seeing uh, Julia Marquez, uh, the the dad. Um, in the back of the Grassini camp, I've got to say, and the change of colours, that was the other thing that was quite interesting this year. Um, the, the deliveries for the first time under the lights at Qatar always look that bit more spectacular. One of the Ducati riders that I was really surprised at being so far down the line was Marco Bezzecchi. Considering last year, you know, he was up there, but keep hearing the same thing. He's not gelling that well with the bike. Mm, well... I think loyalty to the VR46 organization, to Valentino Rossi, may have been slightly misplaced. I think he really probably needed to have moved on. We'll see how that develops as the course of the year goes on. Yeah. Um, you know, Buzeki had a great finish the last year, and, and, and I felt that he, he was on the move, but he didn't. He stayed in the end, and that's loyalty to, to the team. Um, sometimes you've got to be a bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, ruthless when it comes to your yeah. career. Um, maybe he will regret perhaps staying where he stayed. We'll we'll wait and see as 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 that kind of evolves during this this coming year. But I mean, at the end of the day, MotoGP probably more questions than answers there at the moment. I don't think we can really yeah. take too much apart from Peko. I don't think we can take too much out of what happened in Qatar and transpose it to coming rounds. I think that Bagnaia was was the master for me. Um, in a weekend of interesting results. I mean, if you go to Moto3 and Moto2, I mean, they, they, again, the Colombian national anthem, we're getting quite used to that. And the Boscos Guro chassis in, in Moto2, um, pretty good as well. And uh, Barry Baltus, I mean, there's a lovely story behind that. Barry Baltus, Barry was named, you know, his, his dad was a, was a big Barry Sheen fan. So, you know, sadly, Barry... Sheen died before Barry Baltus was born. I mean, Barry Baltus is 19. Barry Sheen died 21 years ago on the day that Barry Baltus got his first ever podium uh, in Grand Prix. 
um, which is a as I love that kind of synergy. That that really is a, a little bit special. And and of course, Father Baltus will be more than happy to um, have Barry's namesake on the podium for the first time. I can imagine there will have been a bit of a celebration going on there. Oh, definitely. There's such a lovely, like, heartwarming story to hear. You know, these young up-and-coming rider get on the podium, the Ode to Barry She, which is really close to me and my family as well. So that was so nice. I loved it. But talk about, like, hectic with um, Moto3, the amount of crashes in that race. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. That, if there's no action in MotoGP, Moto3 just had all of it. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... The one thing about the the track at Qatar, I thought this year as well, we didn't get long lap penalties for track, you know, exceeding track limits. We had some proper racing this weekend from a track limits point of view, um, which I am so pleased to have seen. Now, the way they've done it, obviously the curbs, you know, talked about chatter a bit earlier on. There's nothing like chatter where you're on your high part of the curb because at Qatar, that is some teeth shattering chatter, I can tell you. Um, so, and, and of course, if you go over the top and out the other side, and there was a couple of crashes in Mono 3 where they did slip off the edge of the curb, that can be disastrous as well. But basically, it's self-penalizing. Um, so at the end of the day, Qatar have, have got the track quite good from that point of view. Um, if you go on the green, you're likely to get a penalty. But of course, what they've done is they've designed the curbs and the track. The curbs are much wider with a, an increasing gradient of chatter, of, of, of uh, grade, of, of in the Mizano curbs, serration, whatever you want to call it. And so it does naturally slow you down. There is no advantage being right out there. And I think we ought to see more of that as uh, as tracks evolve. Um, we've done uh, a piece from the Driven guys, if you remember, the track designers um, that we've spoken to here on OMG MotoGP before that uh, take all that into account. But at the end of the day, it's the tracks that kind of dictate how they want it to be. Um, and if we're racing on the same tracks as Formula One, we can't always have what we want as motorcycle racers. Uh, there's always that compromise that's, that's being made there. But I thought Qatar made a really good job of, of providing a racetrack that didn't provide us with a heap of penalties just because somebody nicked three millimetres of green paint. Um, so that was something to cheer. I, I completely agree. When I heard uh, Simon Crayfar talking about it over the, the broadcast, I'm, finally, we're not going to have uh, someone literally just touching the green and then, oh my God, here's another penalty or here's a long laugh or whatever happens. So no, I agree. I think they've done a really good job with the facilities there, the track, the broadcast, everything I thought was really, really good. But I think that just about sums up. Oh, sorry. What were you going to say? Well, we've got, hang on a minute, you're going to be in the deep end here if you don't bring up Jake Dixon. <laughs> oh, no. I am so you sorry. Because um, <laughs> he's damn near family for the Vermeulens, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, um, I completely forgot. What a horrible weekend for Jake, huh? Yeah, I mean, Jake Dixon is is really the, the great British hope. Sorry if you're watching this from elsewhere and you support riders from other, other countries around the world. But uh, Jake Dixon, from a British perspective, is really our, our great hope for for the future and, uh, and and a real disaster for him. And he, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I was sitting with a load of people at home here and they, they kind of don't even flinch. Yeah, you know, oh, look at that, he's flying through the air. They have no clue how much that hurts when you land at that speed from that high uh, in that situation. And despite the fact Jake was declared as nothing broken and all the rest of it, he was still, still declared unfit. To be declared unfit at Grand Prix is quite a big deal because you have got to be hurting really badly if you haven't broken anything to not be declared fit. Uh, and you know Jake would have had a go if, if they'd allowed him to have written. But um, Jake's, again, started the season just where he could do without starting it. And from British fans' point of view, we wish you well, Jake, and hope that um, all is cool for Portie Mao because you will be spectacular there. Oh, it's going to suit him so much, that track. I can't wait. Okay, any more Moto2 that we need to talk about, Keith? No, I think that the, the Jake Dixon thing, I thought I w I'm going to dig you out of that particular hole. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I, I should have said I completely forgot, but I thank you for that. But yes, I'm pretty sure that sums up our Qatar Grand Prix. MotoGP race wasn't that exciting. Pedro Acosta put a little jazz in there for us. But other than that, 
think that sums it up. Let's head to Portimao. Let's head to the roller coaster, as they call it. As usual, guys, if you want to like and subscribe, like and subscribe to this podcast, please feel free to do it. Comment down below. We want to hear from you as well. Or feel free to send us an email. All that info is going to be in the info. But as always, Keith, thank you so much for chatting with me. I love talking all about MotoGP with you. And we'll catch up next time. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Bye.